for reading the word of God for us. Dearly beloved brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, friends and uh, visitors, and also those who are joining us for worship this afternoon uh, via Zoom. Good afternoon. Wave your hand. <laughs> When high tech fail, <clears throat> so how are you today? I'm so happy to be able to see all of you again, uh, worshiping together. Welcome back to our sermon series. Uh, on resurrection of uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, we are actually very thankful uh, that Pastor Chi Hong uh, has planned this series of uh, four sermons on the resurrection of Jesus Christ immediately uh, after the book of Job. Now it gives us the opportunity to examine and to ensure that our faith is firmly established in God, who is sovereign, who is faithful and good in all our suffering. Oops. Mm. Okay, I can't see it, the screen. Okay. The four sermons on resurrection of Christ are as follows. First, the evidence of a resurrection, followed by the Lordship of Christ, and then our resurrection. The last sermon, the number fourth sermon, will be living our resurrected life. Christ's resurrection must be true, or else Christianity is completely useless. Listen to the word of Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 14. Paul says, And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. If Jesus remains dead, Christians are dead because their sins are not forgiven. They will face the awful judgment of God like all other people. If Jesus is alive, our hope is alive and our future is secure forever. So therefore, I urge you to pay careful attention to these four sermons. Two weeks ago, Deacon Sidong preach to us the first sermon from Luke, Luke chapter 24. We examine all the evidences of Christ's resurrection and concluded that seeing is not necessarily believing because resurrection cannot be proven by science. It was a miracle performed by God. And no amount of evidence can convince us to believe in it. Faith is needed. In other words, we need both faith. We need both evidence and resurrection of resurrection and faith in the risen Christ. Today, we will look at the faith issue in relation to Christ's resurrection from John chapter 20 verse 1 to 31. Specifically, we want to know how a personal encounter with the risen Christ 
can change a person's mind to believe in him, to worship him, and to do his will. While meditating on the resurrection of Christ, that changed the lives of the disciples in John chapter 20, my thought was drawn to the people God has sent to change my life for the better, especially those who cared for me unconditionally when I was in need physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Indeed, I can say to you today, I am what I am today because of these kind people appeared in my life. I'm sure you too have someone do good to you and make your life better. Maybe a good parent, a good relative or friend, a good teacher, a good colleague or even a boss who truly understand your needs and help you unconditionally. I'm sure you feel the same way I feel. Very thankful. Very thankful for them and feeling blessed. However, I also know that no matter how many good people I met in my life, no one, no one can do any good for me beyond the grave. For example, a good doctor cannot do anything for me beyond the grave. The truth is that we need God. We need the power from above to help us change our life, not only better, but forever beyond the grave. We need a resurrected Jesus Christ. Our faith depends on him. Our future depends on him. And we need to meet him personally, and we must. So in today's message, John tells us when the unbelieving disciples met the risen Christ, their lives were changed to the better forever. Now, before we unpack the 31 verses, let us pray. Huh? Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for inspiring Apostle John to write down the personal encounter of the disciples with the risen Christ and how their lives were changed for the better forever. As we open your holy word, please open our eyes to see the risen Christ and change our lives for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. According to John, Apostle John, the sequence, the sequence of events on the first day of the week, the Resurrection Sunday or the Easter Sunday, is as follows. Empty tomb was discovered by Mary Magdalene. Mary reported to the disciple. Peter and John went there and confirmed it. Yeah, it is empty. Mary continued to look for the body of Christ. Christ appeared to Mary. Mary reported to the 11 disciples. Christ appeared to the 10 disciples on the Easter evening and gave a preview of how the disciples will be empowered for mission. Thomas was absent, in, insisted to meet the risen Christ. And then, eight days later, Christ appeared to Thomas and he believed Christ is alive beyond any doubt. So as we can see in John's narrative, there is indeed solid evidence 
to show that the resurrection did happen. All the 11 disciples have examined his resurrected body. Having examined the hands and the side of Jesus Christ is the most important and significant evidence. But an even greater significance in John's narrative, listen carefully, is the way in which Christ acted quickly, lovingly, and gently to offer his peace and change the mind of those who seek after him from fear and from doubt to faith and confidence in life, in ministry, and in eternity. The reason Christ wants all people to come and believe in him quickly and let him take charge of their life. In John chapter 12, verse 32, Jesus said, And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. The purpose of Jesus' death, listen carefully, the purpose of Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection was to draw all people, all people, to pay attention to their salvation, to believe that Christ is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. That is why John inserted the words in the last two verses, verses 30 and 31. Now Jesus did, John says, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, refer to Gospel of John, but these are written, referring to the detail of uh, resurrection, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. As we can see, that John left out many other appearances of Christ and focus on these few details, which is enough, as far as he's concerned, to change our mind to believe in Christ and change our life forever. When John says, have life in his name, what does it mean? It means a life in the merit and power of Jesus Christ, a life conformed to his design not our own desire, a life committed to his mission, not our selfish ambition, a life that is eternal, not temporal, a life of victory in eternity. In his name, death will not have the last word. That is what it means. And John in this passage paints the picture, listen, Paint the picture of a loving Savior calling sinners like you and me to trust in Him, to marry Magdalene, a woman who would not give up searching for the body of her beloved Jesus. Why? Because Jesus de delivered her from the torments of seven, not one, but seven evil spirits. Jesus is the person she wants in her life. If she, he is alive, she wants to be with him. If, she, if he is dead, she wants to honor him with spices. When Peter and John left the empty tomb, dejected and went home, Balik Kampung, Mary kept searching for the body of Christ. And she was given the privilege of being the first to see the risen Christ. How Christ did it? A gentle word. Mary, from his mouth. And Mary's eyes were open. And she exclaimed, Rabboni, which means master teacher. Resurrection is 
Therefore, confirm. To the eleven confused and frightened disciples, Jesus sent Mary quickly to tell them that all is well so that they can stop the worrying. Jesus will not allow his disciple to live in fear, but have peace and have faith in him. That is why he told Mary not to cling unto him, but to go quickly and break the good news to the disciple. Christ has risen. The body is not stolen. And on the same day evening, Christ appeared to, in the midst of the ten disciples and showed them his hands and his sight so that they can see for themselves and believe beyond any doubt that he has conquered death. Peace for the disheartened disciples. Listen. Peace for the disheartened disciples was Jesus Christ's top priority. The disciples were afraid that the Jewish religious authority may come and arrest them, especially at this time that the body is missing. The first word from Christ's mouth is Shalom. Peace be with you. Not the peace the world offers, but a peace that has the power to calm the storms of life. An eternal peace we can have in life and in death. As Christ has declared on the cross, it is finished. All the penalties for our sins have been paid by Jesus. God has accepted Christ's sacrifice and opened the way for us to have peace with God. Death is defeated and believers can live with hope of eternal life. Here we see Christ said, peace be with you three times. In the passage in verse 19, 21 and 26, Christ really wanted his disciple to erase every doubt they may have about him and have peace. In this encounter, Jesus not only granted the disciple his peace, he also gave them a preview of how their lives will be changed. In verses 21 to 23, Christ told them that they will be sent to do his work and they will be accompanied by the Holy Spirit and they will be empowered to decide who are forgiven and who are condemned according to the gospel. So Christ is here preparing them for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. In other words, Christ is telling them that their lives, after meeting him here, will be changed forever. And it will be changed for the better forever. So far, we have seen how much Christ really cared for his weak and frightened disciple. In the following verses, verses 24 to 29, John brought in Thomas. Thomas was the only disciple who was not present when Christ appeared to the disciples, the ten of them. But why Thomas? Why he wasn't there when Jesus appeared? We don't know. We don't know. We only know that this incident has brought Thomas a bad reputation. His name is used as a label uh, for the skeptics. People who refuse to believe are called doubting Thomas. Because when the ten disciples told Thomas that they have seen the risen Christ, Thomas said to them in verse 25, unless I see in his hands the marks of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Now, is it fair to condemn Thomas this way? Although Thomas 
was not as prominent as Peter and John. Thomas was a sincere seeker of truth. He was a courageous and honest follower of Jesus Christ. In John chapter 11, when Jesus Christ talks about his death, Thomas said, So Thomas called the twins, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. Thomas also used by Jesus to preach major biblical doctrine. For example, in John chapter 14, when Jesus told the disciple that he is going away and they know where they can find him, straight away, Thomas asked a question and Jesus provided the answer to benefit us. Look, John 14, verse 4 to 6. And you know the way, Jesus said, to where I'm going. Thomas said to Jesus, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Ah, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one, no one can come to the Father except through me. As we can see, how eager Thomas wanted to learn from Jesus. Thomas wanted the truth. The whole truth. And here in John chapter 20, Thomas wants to be sure about what his fellow disciples said before he put his faith in Christ. Thomas' disbelief, listen, was not a stubborn unwillingness to accept the evidence of eyewitnesses. He was a genuine seeker who seek the support in visible evidence, especially in his time, dead person come alive is unheard of. He needs a personal encounter with Jesus Christ like that of his fellow disciples. Yes, Thomas has doubt, but he didn't remain silent because he didn't want to blindly accept something on faith. He wanted to know for sure instead of blindly following someone's belief. Isn't it? Isn't that commendable? And you see, here we see Christ granted him, granted Thomas the evidence he wanted so that he can come to faith like the other disciples. When Thomas exclaimed, my Lord and my God, it brings glory to God. Christ was gentle with Thomas. Christ did not condemn Thomas. Instead, we see Thomas' interest in a real encounter with God has a beneficial effect on the people like you and me who have no opportunity to meet the risen Christ in person. As we see Christ use this meeting with Thomas to declare in verse number 29, blessed are those who have not seen, yet have believed. The lesson John wants us to learn from Thomas' example is that we must and we can also come to faith by reading his gospel. That is why he inserted verses 30 and 31 to say that those who read his record of the resurrection of Christ will also able to come to faith and to have their life change the same way Christ changed the 11 disciples 2,000 years ago. So dearly beloved, have you encountered the risen Christ? If you did, what have changed for the better in your life? Do you take your faith seriously? Is your faith genuine? Thomas' example of seriousness in the issue of faith should remind us 
of the many who are not serious about faith. People who never seriously look into their life to see their needs for real peace in Jesus Christ. And there are also those whom we can call believer in name only. Those who have been baptized but don't know the basics of the faith and the rules of the spiritual life. Such people don't see many sins in themselves and don't feel the need for repentance. And there are also those who seem to be actively serving in the gospel ministry, but in reality, they live a double life. We have heard of famous Christian leaders, Christian speaker, Christian writer, living in sin. And recently, even churches openly approve sexual sins which are condemned by God. Listen to what Christ and Paul said about phony Christian. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 23, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On the day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works? in your name and then will i declare to them i never knew you depart from me you workers of lawlessness this is serious not everyone who called jesus lord and master will enter god's eternal kingdom they are rejected by god because of their hypocrisy they are christians in name but not christian in heart they are workers of lawlessness that means they do not do the work according to god's will they do not follow god's will and in first corinthians chapter 10 the first five verses, Paul said, For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that your fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, referring to the Exodus, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, number five, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Paul is talking about the two million Israelites who crossed the Red Sea and died in the desert after wandering in the desert for 40 years. Many of them never entered the promised land. Verse 2 tells us that they were all baptized by Moses in the cloud and sea, like many who were baptized in the name of Christ today in the church. And in verse 5, it says most of them, most of them, not the few of them, most of them was not pleased. God was not pleased and they perished in the desert. Put together the words of Jesus and Paul, the truth laid before us, listen, brothers and sisters, is that a person can go through baptism and serve in the church without a real change in their heart. And on the judgment day, they will hear God saying to them, go away from me. I do not know you. Dearly beloved, a personal encounter with the reason Christ will change our life. As we see in Paul's conversion, in Acts chapter 9, verse 1 to 22, we have just read responsively. Now, you see, before Paul, at the time was called Saul, before he met the risen Christ, Paul thought Jesus was a liar. And people following him are foolish and deserve to be punished. But Christ would change his mind. On his way to Damascus to arrest Christian, got a permission from the chief priest. Christ spoke to Paul gently. So, so, why are you persecuting me? 
the use of Saul's name twice conveys emotion of affection, convey the love of Christ for Paul. Just as when Jesus was at the home of Mary and Martha, he said to Martha, Martha, Martha. So this is surprising to Paul. But what follows was even more surprising. Instead of putting Paul to death instantly and end the persecution immediately, Jesus spared Paul's life. Paul heard the voice of Jesus but did not see him. And there were three major changes in Paul's life after his encounter with the risen Christ. The change of mind, the change of master, and the change of mission. God changed Paul's mind from thinking Jesus as a liar to believe that he is the Lord, the Son of God. God changed Paul's master from serving men to serving Christ, from serving the Jewish religious leaders to serve the risen Christ. God changed Paul's mission from persecuting Christians to persuading people to become one. When he appeared at a synagogue in Damascus in our responsive reading, Paul was proclaiming Jesus is the Son of God. Paul was not in the synagogue to report how many Christians he has arrested. The Jews were amazed the Bible tells us, and they were confounded by Paul's sudden change. Now, close to home, we have Chelsea, who met Jesus Christ through reading of the Bible with Sister Priscilla. How she has changed was amazing. A few days before she went home to be with her Lord and Savior, she told me that she has peace. Although she cannot breathe properly. And in the eulogy heard during the week service, her best friend, Rachel Gunn, was amazed by her change from an unbeliever to a believer. And Sister Priscilla, Remember how Chesia came to believe in Christ and became very eager to help in church wedding and even the children's hunger fund. So now, back to where we started. The Apostle John emphasizes the gentleness of Christ and the importance of a genuine faith is to encourage those who have doubt in him to seek a personal encounter with Jesus Christ through what he has written in this chapter and the chapter that follow. We are to seek personal encounter with Christ, not a load of evidence. Have a genuine faith, not blindly follow others. So, for application, pre-believers, I hope that you will not, if you have not received Christ, if you have not received the peace of Christ, may peace be with you. If you have yet to believe in Jesus Christ, you need to know that Jesus Christ really loves you. By the way that he cared for the 11 disciples and he is more than happy to grant you the peace like he did to the disciple. The peace of Christ will change your life for the better and forever. It happened to me 47 years ago 
When I was young, I never expected to become a Christian. I wanted to serve the army and enjoy playing golf with my friends after retirement. I wanted to live my life the way I like it. That was my plan for my life, a plan I faithfully maintained. But God sent an army colleague to tell me that Jesus is the only way to heaven. Quoting the answer Jesus gave to Thomas in John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. With that, I prayed a prayer of repentance. And amazingly, my life became an affair of God instead of golf. Along the way, I found my vocation changed from a soldier to a pastor, from protecting the country to preaching the gospel. It happened naturally without fanfare. It wasn't a deliberate change for personal development, but simply fulfilling the Great Commission. Whatever con my way, I do. Not a career, but a calling. And saving souls has become the story of my life. Never a moment I regretted the path I took. So dearly beloved, you too can embark on this amazing journey with Jesus Christ. For the believer, you must make sure that you have indeed changed your mind about Christ. And he is indeed your new master. And you have a new mission. Do not live a double life. If you are still living in sins, please repent. Confess, repent, and return to Christ and serve him. Thank and praise God for your faith in Christ. For those of you who have come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Before we sing the closing song, let us spend a few minutes reflecting our lives and our encounter with Jesus Christ. And thank God for the changes that make our life better forever. So let's take a minute or so to do that reflection. <laughs> 